introduce Martin Ensherwood. Martin, okay, now everyone on the on the call, look at Martin and then look at me. Yeah. Uh, you see, Martin, <laughs> Martin, uh, you can see Martin is Scottish. Yeah, is Scottish. And, um, you know, I'm from Ghana, right? Yep. Yeah. And in Ghana, uh, we, we have the we have the kente, and Martin has got the tartan, yeah, and they have this tartan. They're very similar type of designs to the Ghanaian kente. So we, we have a Ghana Scottish association, uh, but beyond that, and more importantly, uh, when I say look at Martin, look at me. Martin is actually my brother from another mother. So. Uh, I say this as well, and I always say this at every conference. In, in 2014, when I said, I'm like, I want to do Agile in Africa and Scrum Day London, Martin was the first person in the world that said, Nana, I'm in and I'm going to support you. And since then, uh, Martin has always, every single year, he's always been there to support whatever we do in Africa. And uh, for me, it's just really a, a, a joy to have Martin here in 2022, uh, Agile in Africa. Martin, I'm not gonna keep long and do a big massive introduction. I think we know you really well. Martin is a professional scrum trainer. He owns his own company, Naked Agility. And um, Martin is also a coach. He's done lots of different stuff across industries globally. Is a technical person as well. He's uh well, you'll see his profile online later. Martin, over to you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Can you hear me okay, Nana? I can it's, hear you. It's, it's lighting up, so you must be able to hear me. I um um I was surprised you called on me. My slot was tomorrow, and I'm like, oh, got to figure out how to what we're gonna what we're gonna do. So Wonderful. um no, it's it's as usual. It's great to be here. I was gonna wear my African shirt and and I was gonna I was gonna wear my hat like uh, Arthur. And... Oh, you can still do that. But and, and I, can I just say to everyone that Martin was supposed to be on tomorrow, but today I just thought you know what because we had a slot. Patricia is actually caught up in something because we were running late because you know we overran with the speakers, and so I think she's struggling to come online. And I just reached out to Martin and I just said to Martin. Do you mind doing something today? And Martin said, yes. And we can do it. I said, oh. and said yes, I can do it. First of all, he panicked and said, oh. but then he said, yes, I can do it. So of Martin, thank you, because you're always ready to respond to change. Thank you for today. Thank you. <laughs> you're, 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 you're very, very, very welcome. And responding to change is quite important. Um, I actually was really interested in, um, some of the stuff that, that, that Grace was talking about and uh, some of the stuff that Arthur was talking about. And I want to kind of build off that, but obvious, as well as being a little bit orthogonal. So the thing I'm like, I'm going to try this. Let's see if this works. Where's the button? This button. There we go. Oh, well, that's not going to work because you can see yourself. So let me fix that. There we go. Uh, can you see my hand drawn terrible effort yes. at uh, my pen skill pen that skills are legendary um but not in a good way infamous might be that's the that's the in a bad way isn't it infamous so i'm gonna i'm going to uh, try i'm gonna do a little bit of uh, drawing because i think um it adds value to this 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 story and i i, I I've been doing a lot of research recently, so this is a really new talk, really new topic uh, for me. Um, and what I've been diving into is this idea about why are these Tayloristic organizational practices, and I'll explain what, what, what that means as we go, but why are these old organizational structures and practices like Grace was talking about, why, why are they getting in the way and what can we do about it? And I had a little bit of an epiphany recently, uh, listening to uh, Nils, who was at the first Agile in Africa. Yeah. Yes, uh, back in the back in the day. Uh, Nils, listening Nils to Pledgen, right? Nils Pledgen. Yeah. Um, 
and I've been listening to and reading a lot of his content. So this is this is my effort at explaining what he talks about. So if you want the real stuff, you know, you gotta go, you gotta go top the nails. This is this is my effort to try and understand that. And and what he what he talks about, and I think this is this is a, a really important for me. Is I always talk about Tayloristic organizations v's modern, right? And there's not really a good story there. So um, I've I've adopted some of Neil's terminology. Um, I think Arthur, you'll you'll like this, Grace as well. Um, it's alpha organizations are the old way of doing things that was designed um, at a particular time, and I'll talk about it. And then beta organizations is the uh, uh, self-organizing. Um, a decentralized type of organization. Uh, so I've entitled this why alpha model organizations are the default, right? Because almost all organizations that we meet, we engage with, that we see are alpha organizations. So let, let's, uh, if that would change, that would be great. There we go. I have a, 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 a very simple graph. No, it's not. It's not a simple graph, but I will explain it. Um, a graph here uh, talking about, let me change my pen uh, to be blue. There we go. Can, can I, I want to ask if everyone can see your screen or is it, is it just me that sees a small screen? Uh, you shouldn't see a small screen. Is there a way to uh, spotlight my video? I think if I if we if I click on pin maybe pin. Yep. Okay. I, if so, I don't know if any, anyone else is. I. You know what? I can I can switch this around. No, no, no. It's it's no, it's instead. fine because no, it's fine. All you all they have to do is click on the three little dots in the corner of your of your picture. Um. Your, yep. And uh, that will just you, they can pin it to the screen. That's all. Okay. Cool. It might be well in all the views i see it full but anyway whatever's right uh so i oh let me move my mouse there we go i've got this 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 lovely graph here um and what i want to to, to you to picture in your head is this this is a timeline across the bottom here and then vertically on our graph is um the dynamic markets within which corporations exist Right. So don't think about the work that we're physically doing. I'm not talking about the work that we're doing. I'm talking about we've got an organization and it interacts with markets. Right. Um, and in a, 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 a way before the industrial age, the industrial revolution, um, we had kind of the age of craft manufacturing. And during the age of craft manufacturing, um, we had very high dynamic markets, right? The markets were really uh, uh, dynamic. If you, you went to a crafts craftsperson and you wanted, I don't know, some kind of cupboard or cupboard or unit for your house, uh, then you would uh, um, measure the wall. They would build it exactly how you wanted it. It's a custom piece just for you. And in certain parts of the world, you can still get that in, in any part for the right price. You know, you can get that, um, but it's incredibly expensive. But that was that age of craft manufacturing, right? Every single piece that was created was unique, was distinct. So the, the difference was incredible. Um, and the market was very dynamic, right? You had lots of different people asking for different stuff. And then we kind of moved into this industrial revolution, industrial age, where we needed to build lots of stuff really quickly, right? We needed a lot of stuff really quickly. And the, the, the pace of change in those markets was actually very slow, right? Because we kind of created standard operating procedures. We created default ways of working um, that, that codified those, those activities. So we took this stuff and made it really simple. And the market changed in that it become became much slower and sluggish and dull and not dynamic, right? Because there were a small number of companies creating a huge amount of stuff. So consumers didn't have a lot of dynamic choice, but they did have the ability to 
uh, um, you know, get cheap goods, right? So lots of cheap goods, but each company existed in a market without many competitors, right? Slow and sluggish. Uh, but then after the Industrial Revolution, kind of around the... Oh, see, this is my drawing skills coming in. They're, they're absolutely terrible. Uh, around the 1920s, 1930s, the market started to get more complicated. You started to build up more companies doing the same thing. So companies started to have competitors and have lots of competitors. And as the world shrunk, right, as, as markets expanded and communications increased, and the ability for us to move stuff around the world and um, markets became more dynamic. People were starting to ask for different things. And a new type of company was kind of imagined at the time uh, by somebody called Mary Follett. Um, but her stuff was kind of pushed to the bottom, kind of ignored, um, and then was rediscovered like 30 years later. Uh, but as we got towards the 1970s, the markets were getting much, much more complex, right? There was much more stuff going on, many more, even more competitors in the market. And the time at which the practices that were created during the industrial age were no longer relevant was kind of around the 1970s, right? That's when the markets kind of got complicated and dynamic enough that this old way of working where we created standard operating procedures, we had the same inputs, got the same outputs, uh, we could do the same thing over and over again and get the same results, kind of started to disappear, right? Um, think about all of the companies that went out of business in the 70s and 80s because they just couldn't move fast enough uh, to be able to keep up with demand, keep up with competition, even the car manufacturers in the US were in danger of disappearing because of Toyota and Toyota's ability to deliver dynamically to the market. Um, you ordered a car, they built that car for you with your custom features and capability on it and then delivered it to you. And the rest of the market who was still using those industrial age Tayloristic practices just weren't able to compete at all. But then the advent of this in the 70s of software and the capabilities that added to organizations to be able to change faster, do more things with less uh, capability, automation in factories, right? Starting to, 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 to allow that dynamic, more custom items in the market. And then the market starts demanding more and more of those uh, 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 types of things. And we've ended up in this age of global markets where the change is so immense that we really have little or no control over it. I, I like to think of um, the markets within which organizations exist are kind of like how uh, uh, Darwin described uh, the, the, the animal kingdom, right? You've got a, a, an opportunity arises in the market uh, either a new company or an existing company takes advantage of that opportunity. If that market then starts to disappear, a company has to either change to do something else or die, right? It, it could die out. The company becomes extinct because they're not able to change what they're doing or don't want to. Um, but as that organization dies, new markets are opened up, new companies come into existence to take advantage of those markets, and they exist for as long as they are able to change dynamically to those markets. So what tends to happen is companies and organizations that are very small, let's say under 25 people, just to pick a number, but under 25 people, are able to continue to be dynamic, right? Um, we can just talk, I know every single person in my company, I maybe have a, a beer with them at the end of the evening, uh, we talk about stuff all the time, we know each other, we can collaborate and we can uh, uh, just get things done. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something and I need something a little bit different, Grace, can you just help me with this uh, thing and do it in this other way that we've never done before? Sure, I can, let's try it and see if it works and just collaborate on it. Once organizations get up to about 25 people, the number of people in the organization gets a little bit too much, gets too difficult to um, understand what's going on, to do all of the things. So we start, start trying to make things simple, right? We try to start trying to create 
uh, uh, standard operating procedures. Here's the way we're going to do this thing and we're always going to do it this way from now on. And we end up in that bureaucracy that uh, Arthur was talking about, that it builds up over time. And I, I, I like to think of that as, um, I guess, organisational cruft, right? Cruft is a very interesting word. It just means, you know, that kind of lime scale and scale that builds up. If you live in London, I know many of you don't. I don't know if Accra has a lime scale problem, but if you sorry, buy a Martin. kettle, yes. Sorry, Martin. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, I, I'm getting some feedback in the chat that this your your screen, the handwriting looks blurred. So maybe you want to switch. I can and, switch. I can yeah, switch. Yeah. Hold on. Let me try sharing <laughs> my screen instead. Uh huh. Ah, there you go. Hey guys, thanks for the feedback. You're, You're going to see the whole stuff. screen now, but yeah, um, yeah, it's very. How do clear I see? Now. How do I see? How do I see you guys at the same time? Because all of it's disappeared. I know. I know. I, I, I know. That's the challenge when you're in full this, screen. It's so disconcerting. Well, I'm not in full screen, but this, it, it's, it's. I, I feel like it's a Zoom issue, so we'll just leave it. I can't see you. Okay. Never mind. Ah. Uh, so, yes, well, the details on this graph are, are a little bit unimportant. Uh, you can kind of, I've, I've got my mouse now, but you can kind of see down here, um, we've just got the, the high dynamic uh, of the market, uh, little competition happening in here, and then things start to get fast moving again over here. It's really that flow of the graph. Does, it, does this make sense for you, Nana, the way I'm explaining it? It does. Yeah, it does for me. So what's, what's really interesting is that if we look at the oh, if we look at if i can change my pen again i'm going to go thin and could go black there we go um is that this really equates to two two different markets right that our company can exist in um i'm, I'm suggesting that one of them doesn't exist anymore but there are organizational structures that were developed for it so the one on the left here is the is the complicated market Right. And in the complicated market, something something we can actually do something really powerful in the complicated market. We can take that thing that is quite complicated that we might do. That's our interaction with our customers or, or, or however it is we, we make money. Um, we can apply knowledge. And in that application of knowledge. We turn it simple. Right, because we create this repeatable process or procedure that we can uh, continuously do. Now, even in complex markets, we can also have certain types of work that we do that we make simple, but the market is still complex. So the other side of this complicated story is the complex, the complex markets. And there's no way, no way to turn complex things into simple things because they're just far too dynamic they're unrepeatable you do the same thing again and you get different results this is where those empirical practices that we talk about in scrum um are were, were, were developed and are designed to thrive um i'm trying to see if i can, there we go now i can see so um, but what does happen in the complex world? Nana, you've you've got an organization. You work with organizations in the complex world. What what are things that happen at random intervals in the complex world that you have absolutely no control over? Well, um, in a complex world, devaluation of the currency is one, and um, okay. you know market market changes. And are they predictable? Uh, not really, not in this day and time. I mean, okay. Uh, so we so the predict. thing that happens, the thing that happens, Nana, is we get surprises. Absolutely. And we're constantly bombarded with surprises. It could be surprises in what's happening in the market. Right. It could be surprises that we didn't know what a competitor was working on. It could be surprises that the thing we're trying to do is much more, much different from what we thought it was. It's constantly throwing out surprises and there's no way to turn that complex world into a simple world. So 
all of the practices that were developed in the complicated space for an alpha model organization are the practices that you see in most organizations today. Okay, so, oh, that's the wrong button. In most organizations, you'll see a pyramid structure of hierarchy in the organization. You'll have a separation of the, the thinking from the doing, right? The thinkers and the doers are kept separate. And then we'll have direction coming from the top, and this is our steering, right? So we have these alpha organizations with direction coming from the top, uh, um, the thinkers at the top deciding how we're going to do stuff, what we're going to do, and then the doers at the bottom uh, doing it. And the market is down here. The market is down here at the bottom. So whenever something, one of these surprises happens, right, because we've got an alpha model organization, right, that was designed for the complicated markets, operating in the complex modern markets of today, they're no longer able to respond because something happens in the market and we get a, a, a feedback, right? We get an instruction comes into our, our organization, but it comes into the organization right at the bottom because the people interacting directly with the market and talking to the customers have no power whatsoever to make changes in the way we do things. So they have to ask their boss, who has to ask their boss, who has to ask somebody up in the thinking zone. Um, in the thinking world, somebody at that level who has the authority to make decisions. They maybe take a couple of weeks, they make a decision, and then that decision has to filter down all the way to get to the market. So the time it takes for this process is too long, right? Think of that, that opportunity in the market is just floating by and the organization has to reach out and grab it, right? They have to do something different than they normally do in order to take advantage of that opportunity. And if it takes too long for that decision-making process to happen, they're never going to be able to move fast enough to take advantage of the opportunity because those smaller organizations with less than 25 people that don't have this problem because the guy at the bottom walks into the CEO's office and says, look, we can take advantage of this and it just happens. So that's that alpha model existing in the complex markets, right? You have this incorrect way of working. But if we take a look at what, what, what would you want in the complex world, right? Well, in the complex world, let's see if I've got uh, another space so I can draw this. Do, 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 do. I've got one. Here's one. I could do. Well, here's one I prepared earlier, Nana. How much time do I have, Nana? Uh, let me just double check. Because I know I'm sneaking into a spot we might not uh, have. No, it's... Uh... I'm gonna, I can double check, but you crack on. I'll just I'll let you in a couple of seconds. Perfect. So if we if we focus a little bit on those alpha organizations, just for a moment, if I can get this to change, there we go. There we go. By uh, way, I would say. Uh, sorry, uh, Martin. I've moved Patricia to tomorrow. Yeah, and so uh, you got at least another fifteen twenty minutes. Okay, cool. I can bombard you with my 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 bollocks for another 15 to 20 minutes so um the 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 this alpha organization if we just focus on that where we've got steering coming from the top what what organizations tend to try and do because they don't want to give up their their hierarchy right um, they don't want to feel like they lose control because this is a command and control environment. You've got those commands going down, responses coming up, and it's taking too much time. But most organizations exist there. So what they tend to do is they try and add more angles of steering, right? So you probably heard of communities of practice. Quite often an alpha organization will build in communities of practice so you create this new triangle with a different direction of steering on top of the other one. And then perhaps there's something else going on. So you create another direction of steering. Does anybody know what, what that's called when you keep adding these additional levels of steering? I'm going to chat. 
waste well it's definitely wasteful right it's definitely wasteful but that's 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 not it's actually got a, 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 a an organizational structure name and you will recognize it confusion i like that one confusion um it's actually matrix matrix organizations so matrix organizations were first introduced around the 1930s as far as i can make out and they were an implementation of mary follett's ideas around pushing responsibility down the organization and it was a way to increase the longevity of the alpha organization while not actually having to make any changes i think it, it, both grace talked about that and arthur talked about that right we don't want to make the change because it's too hard when in actual fact this adding more layers on top more different steering directions on top is not going to solve the problem of the time it takes to get things done right it's just steering from a different direction so matrix organizations did extend the life of uh, um, these alpha organizations, uh, but there's still that that end in sight. So what 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 should we do? What should we do differently? Well, what what we need, I'm just going to use a blank page, um, is we need an organization that responds dynamically to the market. Right. I'm going to call this beta. We need a beta model organization rather than an alpha model organization. And what, what that looks like is we need lots of, oh, that didn't work. We need lots of little nodes, little teams that are all engaging directly to the market, right? So these engage directly to the market and each of these is made up of a number of different people, right? So these are our part of our cross-functional teams. But they're not, these cross-functional teams are talking directly to the market and the market's talking directly to them. So you might think of each of these little cells, these teams are, are probably responsible for invoicing. I'm using the virtual invoice, right? But invoicing customers and getting money from them. So profit and loss exists here. Uh, budgets exist here. And um, that's who's talking directly to the customer. And then in the center of our organization, we have a whole bunch of additional nodes that provide services to each of these periphery. Let's call this periphery. Perif. Did I tell you I'm dyslexic? That means spelling, not my strong suit. Writing, not my strong suit. Speaking, <laughs> not my strong suit. Uh, but the periphery talks directly to the market. The center doesn't have any interact, uh, limited, right? But doesn't have any direct in interaction with the market. So if the center wants to provide some additional service to the periphery, they have to solicit the periphery for funding because that's where the money is. So this organization is able to dynamically adapt to the changing needs of the market. If something happened in the market and things that let's say these two teams here are working on is 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 no longer valid it goes into maintenance mode so one of the teams moves uh, 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 into the center because it's not a commercial product anymore it's just something that happens to exist for a while and maybe some part of the organization kind of disappears Right? And it's filled by new opportunities in the market, new things going on. And because the periphery has the money to be able to interact directly with the market, they're able to do that. This is a decentralized structure for our organization. Um, if you want to look up some stuff around it, look up Beta Codex. Uh, Betacodex.org has lots of papers on how this might look in the organization, but it is not going to tell you how to structure your organization because that's as needed based on what the people in your organization need to, to be able to respond to the market, right? So it feels a little bit loose and not specific, but it has to be because every market that your organization enters into is different. 
right? It's that how do we deal with this unique and the surprises? Well, we have to be able to dynamically adapt to it, which means that there's no concrete always work practice in the, practices in this space. Maybe some of these cells are scrum teams. Maybe some of these cells are Kanban teams. Maybe some of these cells are both. Maybe other cells do something completely different based on the type of work, the type of service they're providing. That's all okay and up to the individual cell. There is no imposition from the outside of any particular way of working and way of doing stuff. Uh, so if I flip into, here's one I prepared earlier, this one. There we go. This has even got color, Nana. It's even better. Um, so while most orgs, organizational structures, while I'm most organizational it. structures are alpha organizations, alpha organizational structures, the processes, the practices, the way we organize stuff, the hierarchy, the departments, all of those things were developed in slow moving markets that had very little competition, right? We didn't need to take advantage of this opportunity was, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, um, uh, uh, Livingston, who was a, a, a doctor in Scotland who ran some uh, textile mills. His company and his, his, his thing that he did existed for well over a hundred years, right? The, 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 the opportunity that they had was sitting floating along right next to the company. They didn't have to reach very far to get it. It was within reach the whole time. There was nobody else trying to trying to take advantage of that opportunity, they had a total lock on the market. That market doesn't exist today. Even if it does exist, the minute you your company takes advantage of it, you know there's five other companies that are gonna look and go, ooh, they're making money over here. I want some of that. And suddenly they're in your market as well. So you need this very dynamic set of ways of working a beta organization in order to be able to take advantage um, of what's going on. So the question you might ask that I can hear, um, if Arthur's still here, I can hear Arthur asking it in the background, is how the heck do you get from alpha to beta, from A to B? How does that happen? Well, that's a, a very interesting question. I would say that the, there's no right way to move from alpha to beta. But I'll tell you a little secret. There is always a beta organization. There always is a beta organization inside of your existing organization. The alpha constructs are artificial. Think about this. How do you, if you work inside of a larger organization, how do you get things done? Do you escalate to your boss who escalates to their boss who escalates? Is escalation a good way to solve that problem? Or do you go talk to the person you know you need help from and they're reasonable, they help you because they know that you're going to help them at some point in the future? That's a beta organization. That's these individual cells all talking to each other, right? Dynamically to be able to get things done, solve the business problems. Uh, 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 and achieve stuff and everything else, the alpha constructs are actually placed on top of it because we think we need to compartmentalize and codify, right? Lock down how something works so we can continue to take advantage of it, but we don't. Uh, one of the techniques uh, that I, I really like the name of, I, I, it, it, it's fantastic, organizational hygiene. Um, having some kind of organizational hygiene event where you go look at all of the things that are the way we do things here and figure out which of them you don't need to do anymore because they don't make any sense or which of them are inhibiting your ability to deliver values in an organization and clean them up, right? Get them, just agree to stop doing them, right? That's, that's the hard part, right? Is just get that agreement to stop doing them. Uh, so one of the things, and let's make sure that I'm not going to write over the top of this. I'm going to add another layer just in case. Um, but what we can do is we can go into the, the organization, the alpha organization, and we can agree to have uh, an open space. So we have this, this 
And there's a, a construct called Open Space Beta, which is based on Open Space Agile. All open source, so you can go find all of this stuff online and go go do it. But this is Open Space Beta. And in Open Space Beta, you'll have uh, two open spaces that are 90 days apart. One at the beginning of this change effort and one at the end of the change effort. So this is 90 days. And the idea is that you change your entire organization from alpha to beta inside of those 90 days. The purpose of the open space is to invite everybody in your organization, everybody in your organization, to participate in figuring out what are the things that we need to start doing, what are the things that we need to stop doing in order to make that transition. And within the bounds of those 90 days, you have authority from high enough in the organization that you can just do it. Do those things, make those changes, flip those switches, turn those things off, turn those other things on. And at the end of the 90 days, you have a, a review of what were the things that worked for us, what didn't, right? You probably recognize some of the, the terminology and figure out what, what we need to do next. And then you have a breathing space afterwards where you're not expected to make any changes because you need to see stuff working in your organization to be able to know whether it's successful. So using this open space model, um, I know I've not used it yet within an organization, but I've liaised with Nils and a few other people that, that have used it. Um, and in almost all cases, they've been able to affect organizational transition from alpha to beta in one 90 day uh, uh, trial. They've had uh, one organization where they had to do another one afterwards because the organization realized that they just they, they got there they got to beta and they started falling back to alpha quite quickly and they didn't have the level of authority that they needed in the organization to keep the changes that they decided to make so things started to backslide um, and it is worth noting that as you go forward into the future you wouldn't need to do these big organizational change efforts but having Re constant uh, repeatable organizational hygiene events right where you look at the things that we're doing and figure out what not to do anymore um, is an important part of not sliding back into those alpha constructs appearing over the top of our organization again uh i thought i had a maybe i don't because I wasn't quite ready, Nana. That's your fault. I wasn't quite ready to do the to do to do to do the talk. Um, so I guess I'm gonna gonna stop there and see if there's any any questions. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Uh, you you have, you've actually finished right on time, and um, and I am uh, you know. Martin, uh, this particular topic, yeah, and, and looking at the alpha organization working in that complicated space, and then looking at the beta organization, um, and you know the whole thing around beta codes, and you know you remember um, Neil Fledgen's book, Organized for Complexity, and that book, the, the, the beta org, perfect, perfect, the beta organization. That uh, I read that book and it was also absolutely, it was very revealing. It was very revealing, and um, I I thoroughly enjoyed reading that book. And in all honesty, um, listening to Niels and and also uh, reading that book when Niels came to Africa to Ghana, and then reading that book, I. I, it changed a lot of my views as well. Well, it confirmed a lot of my views on what I felt about Agile, but also what I felt about organizations. And going through that material, that book, um, you know, and just looking at the beta codex stuff online, I'm so glad that you've talked about it today because I was really looking forward to someone also mentioning something around how to organize for complexity beyond agile yeah. and how can we make sure that when we organize as well that we're we're organizing teams to be more customer facing 
So I really love what you've done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then this is this is how, and this is what I've been helping organizations to come to terms with. Uh, the way we can organize, we talk about operational efficiency, organizational design, behavior, culture, leadership, and all of that stuff. I'm glad that you've actually, the support teams in the middle, the, the service teams on the, on, on the periphery, talking to the markets. Um, I'm really glad that you've touched on this. And I, I just want to say a big thank you because this is one of my favorite topics as well, organizing for complexity. Yes. Um, I, I think, Nana, the thing that everybody's going to struggle with, and I did as well when you start diving into to, to beta codex, is just like Scrum doesn't have the answers, right? Beta Codex doesn't have the answers to your questions. Yes. Scrum's not there to tell you how to do the work or the way you should do the work. It says, here's a framework within which the work can be done, the minimum framework. And that's really what Beta Codex is. What's, what's the minimum framework that you would expect in your organization? How do you answer some of the straightforward questions like um, who's in the center and who's in the periphery, as well as, uh, um, you know, how, how do you do budgets, right? The, the Nils has got a, a paper on Beyond Budgeting, which is how do you do budgets in this new world, which has nothing to do uh, with traditional budget mechanics. Um, absolutely, absolutely. There's lots of really cool stuff. So I really recommend Nilsie's book, Organized for Complexity. Um, yeah. And I've got the link that I posted in the chat. I have uh, links for all of the content. Nilsie's book, Reinventing Organizations Beyond Budgeting, Turn This Ship Around, uh, Drive by Dan Pink. Um, you know my one of my favorite, you know one of my favorite articles is from the US Department of Defense, the Detecting Agile Bullshit article. Yeah. Love yeah. that one. Um, lots of cool stuff in there. The good, the good news is that Akaditi is same the beta along the same lines yeah very distributed but last time i was there which in fairness was a while ago when am i coming to to ghana again nana you, you've got to come in 2023 for agile in africa 2023 because you have a story to tell you have to be there that would be awesome but then i would have to draw like but for real in person, that's not going to... Well, you can do it on the big screen and you can be drawing and people can see it on the big screen. Uh, where's my button to change that? There it is. That's see, I wasn't ready today. Wasn't ready. <laughs> actually, you were coming after... You're scheduled to speak after Patricia. So just today, actually. But you, know, you were down for after Patricia. Oh, because that's not what I have on my list. No, no, that's tomorrow I have on my list. I think that one, they must have sent you an old one or something. Uh, the, the, the program on the be, website. Be. No, on the website, it's it's today. It's a website? <laughs> <laughs> Martin, once again, I want to say a big, massive thank you to you. And uh, You are very I, welcome. Round of applause from everyone. And on behalf of the whole team, I want to say a big, massive thank you. Thank you to, to you. I love the take on Beta. I am so, so glad that you talked about Beta. I'm glad about all the other topics as well that we talked about today.